Good afternoon and welcome to Stock Talk. My name is Sean Kaback of Manitoba Air Culture in Portage and I will be your host. Pam Iwanchesco in Dauphin will be assisting. We're glad you can join us for today's presentations, which will be recorded so you can view them at a future date. If you have any questions during the session, please type them into the chat and we will do our best to have them answered. In last month's Stock Talk, we had two informative Ask the Vet presentations, one on calving tips by Dr. Mark Filippo of St. Claude Vet Clinic, and the second one on vaccination programs for the cattle herd by Dr. Tanya Anderson of the Gladstone Vet Clinic. So if you missed last month's Stock Talk, you can go back and watch the recording. Calf livestock insurance through MASC is still available with today's strong prices. Producers may want to look at blocking in some of those prices. And this is the premiums and prices available as of yesterday. And even if you don't go for the top price, which right now you can lock in 366 a pound, even if you went with a little lower insured price of 350, which is worth 2100 a calf for the September 30th policy period, that would cost you $30 a calf. So definitely producers should check this out. Without sounding like a broken record, dry conditions and a lack of snow this winter and spring is continuing. With most of southern Manitoba still less than 50% normal precipitation since November 1st, and some areas are below 25%. Producers may want to consider seeding some annual forage crops because they are much more moisture efficient than perennial forages. The March cattle country has all the results from the McVet annual forage trials which can be found in Seed Manitoba also. And last year across five sites, barley green feed averaged 5.7 ton dry matter per acre with oats at 4.9 ton. So check out all of these results. Warm weather will have us thinking of getting cows out to pasture, even though that's still at least five to six weeks away. Producers should be aware of poisonous plants on pasture. And we have Kim Brown, who is a weed specialist with Manitoba Agriculture, to tell us more about this topic. So welcome, Kim. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, if that's okay. Go ahead. Um... You can see it now. Yeah, I just need to put it in presentation mode. Oh, there we go. Okay, Perfect. I'll get my mouse, my pointer. Option. There we go. Okay. Thanks very much. Are we good to go then? Um, just stop me at any point if something is not going right. Um, but I'm actually giving a, a presentation today on behalf of Linda Fox. I, I am a weed specialist, so I can definitely talk to you about weeds as plants and lots of things like that. But I'm really not very good at um, you know, marrying that with the livestock end of things. And that is Linda's specialty. She is a farm production extension specialist with Manitoba Agriculture um, out of out of Dauphin. Uh, she was unable to give the talk today, so she's asked me to step in so I can definitely tell you about the plants um, for sure. And um, But I will be giving Linda's presentation um, on her behalf. So there's lots of different poisonous plants in Manitoba. Uh, first and foremost on the list, I think, would be Western water hemlock. That is, you know, one of the most toxic plants um, in agriculture that we have to worry about. Um, but there's other things like field horsetail, uh, choke cherry, arrowgrass, or sometimes it's called seaside arrowgrass. Even though we're in the middle of the prairies, it's not exactly seaside. Um, the milk vetches, the lupines and bracken fern, there's things like that. But there's also injurious plants as well. And that would be things like foxtail barley, wild oats, needlegrass, downy brome, and common burdock would be just a few examples of those. So um, some of the factors that would predispose poisonings, um, that would be there, uh, we can see spectacular losses caused by poisonous plants. They're usually associated with the following abnormal conditions. Um, first and foremost would be overgrazing. Uh, there's less good forage species and there's an increase in poisonous species. And we definitely see this um, after a few drought years or in the years where we've got drought and, you know, we're struggling to find enough good feed, so feed sources for the animals and they end up uh, foraging on species that we wouldn't, they wouldn't normally eat, sometimes due to palatability, sometimes just due to access to them. And, I'm, and I'm, in that case, I'm thinking of water hemlock. Lots of times it's just in wetter areas that we don't tend to put the cattle into or we don't tend to hay those areas anyways. But in the dry years, um, there's just less um, good plants available. And so we can have an increase in poisonous species that are uh, available for the livestock. 
Also immature range readiness. Some of the most poisonous plants grow and mature the earliest. Um, turning them out too early will increase the likelihood of being grazed. And for movement of hungry livestock, when the animals are moved, their grazing habits are disturbed. If they're hungry, they're apt to eat large amounts of available forage. Um, they may not be able to you know, uh, discern which are the good plants and which are the bad plants. When they're hungry, they just want to fill their stomachs. So to decrease the risk of consuming poisonous plants, make sure the animals are full before moving. You don't want to move them um, when they're really hungry. Sorry, my screen has frozen. Okay, can you guys, sorry, my screen's frozen on my end. Can you guys still see, are we still looking at that slide that says predisposing factors of poisoning? Yeah, that one's still up. You wanna go on to maybe your next slide and then maybe it will advance? I can't see anything. Oh, you can't. Uh, no, it's frozen. Um, hang on. Sorry, I'm um. At the, you if you hover at the bottom there, uh, mm -hmm. Kim, and then you mm -hmm. see the little arrows. Can you click on the advanced arrow? Will it allow? Right there. Yes. Oh, there you go. okay. I guess maybe we'll try that. Thank you, thank you, Aaron. Because, yeah, I wasn't sure what to do. It for some reason is frozen. Okay, so also drought, which I talked about a little bit already, but the lack of feed will result in less selectivity of animals, making it more likely that they'll graze poisonous plants. Carefully check water and feed supplies to ensure that it doesn't contain poisonous plants. So, you know, this is where you're going to have to know what some of those plants are, have an idea whether they're there. And also there's just irregular occurrences. Some years poisonous plants are just more abundant than normal. Um, if you maintain good pasture practices, that can help reduce losses. If possible, remove the animals from infested areas and watch the herd carefully or treat the affected animals immediately as soon as you see there's a problem. So first of all, talking about Western water hemlock, and quite often when you're talking about some of these plants, it's good to know the Latin name. We don't expect you to, to, you know, to know it or pronounce it, but sometimes the common names are not the same from place to place. So it's good to know exactly which plants we're talking about. There are some other water hemlocks. They are considered, I would consider everything in this family to be poisonous. The Western water hemlock is the most poisonous of them all. Um, it's generally found in wet, low-lying areas. Um, the bulk of the poisonous oil, which is actually, which is called cicutoxin, is concentrated in the tuberous roots. There is enough oil, though, present even in young shoots to cause problems. A single root is a lethal dose for a cow. So one bite of one root is enough to kill a cow. So the stems and leaves have mu are much less poisonous, although the seeds and the seed heads, which show up a little bit later on in the year, they can have higher concentrations. Symptoms of toxicity would be frothing at the mouth uneasiness, pain, violent convulsions, and sudden mortality. And so this is a picture of Western water hemlock. There's lots of stuff um, in this family, lots of plants in this family that have a very similar type, um, type flower head on them. And some of them really aren't very poisonous at all. In fact, it's very hard to tell uh, Western water hemlock apart from wild parsnip. Wild parsnip can have some, um, can cause photosensitization Sent it, sorry, it, it causes the animals to photosensitize, which means that they get, um, they can get sunburned from e when they consume these plants, but it's really not poisonous like a water hemlock is. Either way, when you see a plant like this, I think it's just best to assume it's water hemlock and, and take it from there. Um, but lots of times we do have mixed populations of wild parsnip, water, the, the, the really bad hemlock, some of the other hemlocks that aren't quite so toxic. Um, either way, I think you need to assume that it's all the really bad stuff and, um, and you know, make your plans accordingly with that. But we've got this very, um, this very, very typical uh, seed head. It's called an umbel. It kind of looks like an umbrella a bit, and it'll have white flowers, which eventually turn into seeds. But again, there's a, a number of plants in that same family, and I would consider them all to be toxic. They are all toxic in some form, but Western water hemlock is, is the most toxic. And here's the leaves. Um, you can see here um, one thing to one way to know if you or if you're trying to discern whether it is water hemlock or wild parsnip, um, the notches uh, in water hemlock, the the veins and the notches will actually go um, with my pointer. The veins here will actually go into the notch on the leaf, whereas on water parsnip they will go into the tip. Water uh, hemlock also will have uh, leaves that are like more than one leaf on this leaf stalk. They're they're called compound leaves. 
whereas water parsnip, which is much less toxic, um, just usually has one or two single leaves. They don't have nearly, they, they don't have compound leaves like this, but you can look at those veins, whether they run to the tip or to the notch. Uh, and, but beyond that, it's a very, very similar looking plant. So this is the root. I would not recommend looking at this with bare hands like the person in this individual, like the individual in this picture is. You should always wear gloves because this is very, very toxic. You do see down here on the roots, there's like a bulb type root here. It's a yellowy, uh, a pale yellow color. And when you section it open with water hemlock, you actually see channels in here. There's little stripy things in here. There's like little layers. So when you open that up, that for sure is Western water hemlock. It is very poisonous and you should not be handling that with bare hands. You should have gloves on because it's so, it's so toxic. Again, here's another section of that root, this time wearing gloves. Uh, when we're talking about field horsetail, a also known as scouring rush, these are the equisetum species. There's two morphological forms. There's the one form that is just like little, like little sticks, one singular sticks, and the other one is more like a little bit of a little bit of a tree. Sometimes people call them, they say they look like little Christmas trees. Um, horses mainly are affected, uh, especially by hay with a high percent of horsetail in it. It seldom causes a problem on pasture. Again, this tends to grow in the wetter areas where your horses aren't going to be, your animals aren't standing in the wet areas, grazing lots of these areas. Um, exclusively, um, you know, they're getting other forages into them. So the symptoms include unthriftiness, weight loss, and gradual weakening of the animal. They can eventually lose muscle control within two to five weeks, and grain-fed animals show a much greater tolerance or resistance to the poisonous compound. So this is field horsetail, and this is the one form of it. You can see it has a, a large underground root system, and we're almost always finding that in the wetter areas. You see tons of it in ditches or in the wetter, swampier areas on pasture. And this is the other form that you see uh, where it's just the single stems. So you'll see both forms side by side. The bulk of it, I think, most of the time is this form that's on screen right now. And it's uh, it, it has silica in it. It's a very scratchy plant, um, a rough, scratchy plant. Animals, again, will eat it, um, but they would prefer other species over that if they had their choice. So the next, moving on to choke cherry, um, the plant is generally unpalatable. It's very bitter tasting, and it's only they'll eat they'll only eat it when there's nothing else available. It's poisonous at all stages of growth uh, because it contains hydrocyanic or prussic acid in its leaves. Symptoms would include uneasiness, staggering, convulsions, and difficulty in breathing. Death will follow bloating, and this can be very quick. It can be within one hour of consumption. So really watch where the choke cherry trees are. Um, sometimes if you're not sure where they are, obviously first thing in the spring you don't. There's sometimes a black fungus that we see on the stems, um, that we'll see on the stems of some of these trees, and you may be able to pick out those trees first thing in the spring before you can see the flowers and or the berries. So with seaside arrowgrass or just arrowgrass, um, it's a grass-like perennial marsh herb. It is anywhere from six to 30 inches tall. It's found in salt marshes and alkaline sloughs throughout Western Canada. And, you know, we are getting into a drier cycle. We do see salinity areas increasing. And so we do find some of these plants that, that grow in saline areas. We may see those increasing as well uh, because of the soil conditions. It'll have very early spring growth and rapid regrowth. So this is one of the ones you have to watch for very first thing in the spring. Stock may select the plant for its salt content. Both the green forage and hay are toxic. So if you've taken it in hay, it's toxic in that hay. Cattle and sheep are the most susceptible. Uh, it's similar or it's the same as the choke cherry poisoning. It's hydrocyanic or prussic acid poisoning is the toxic principle. Symptoms would include rapid or deep breathing. Uh, muscular spasms and convulsions at short intervals, death results from asphyxia or respiratory paralysis. Um, there is a treatment, but it's intra uh, peritoneal injections of sodium nitrate and sodium thiosulfate thiosul have shown good results if, as treatment if administered soon enough. So you'd have to get them on it soon and uh, you'd have to know what you were dealing with. So this is what that plant looks like. It's just kind of like a, almost like a bunch type grass. It can grow quite upright and it's got these very distinctive seed heads on it. Seed heads to me kind of look like plantain, if you know what that plant is, but plantain has a very, very different leaf. It is um, also grows in wet areas, but it has a big, broad, uh, a broad leaf, whereas this has, is, is, a, is a grass. Okay, and talking about the milk vetches now. So they're not exactly uh, poisonous the way the other plants are poisonous in that, but in this case, the milk vetches will absorb inorganic selenium and they may contain as much as 8,000 parts per million of this mineral in their tissues. And so, and poisoning occurs most often in the late summer or fall time. There can be two forms of, of selenium poisoning. So at the end of the day, it's because they're taking up so much selenium rather than a, than a toxin like we do see with some of the other plants. 
The acute form is known as blind staggers. It occurs when animals are suddenly exposed to the plant in high concentration. Symptoms include loss of muscle coordination and moving about restlessly, bumping into fences and corrals. Uh, chronic form symptoms include appetite and weight loss, hoof deformation, and loss of, loss of hair, sore development, and sterility. So again, two forms of poisoning then when the animals have, been have got basically too much selenium. We're talking about bracken fern, really only found in eastern Manitoba, riding mountains in British Columbia. The plant is equally poisonous in green forage or in dry hay. Um, the poisoning is caused by teratanic acid. The plant, cattle that eat the plant can often develop internal hemorrhaging and other complications. Death is caused by hemorrhaging or secondary infections that result. Horses can become somewhat stupefied, timid, and sleepy. Uh, subcutaneous thiamine therapy seems effective for horses only. So if you didn't suspect or if you did know you had some of this poisoning, uh, there is a, ther a possible therapy for horses. But again, as with any poisoning, if you do see some animals um, going down, if there's something wrong with them, you need to get on it very fast. You do not have a lot of time with these. So then moving on to mechanically injurious plants. Um, these are common plants, although they're not poisonous, but they can cause considerable injury to livestock. They can have sharp seeds, sharp awns or spines that work their way into the tongues, gums, eyes, noses, or skins of the animal. The result is extreme discomfort or inflammation, um, causing the result uh, to go off feed. They can lose both weight and condition. And then the sores are often a, a source of entry for pathogenic bacteria into the tissues and circulatory system resulting in local or general infections. Um, for instance, here, foxtail barley, we see lots of this, and there's also a uh, needle grass or spear grass. And so we see with both of these, we've got sharp awns. Both of these would be very, would be, you know, pretty palatable and, and very easy to graze early on in the year. But the problem with both of these, um, especially with foxtail barley, it can set seed quite early on. And the minute those seed heads start to form, there's lots and lots of awns on there. Um, the animals will, you know, will not graze unless they have to. But if they are grazing accidentally, um, a mouthful of those awns can cause a lot of problems. So, you know, you need to try to avoid those foxtail barley patches. And again, we, we have seen an increase in saline loving plants just in the last number of years because of the drought or the dry conditions that we've been in. And this year, again, we're going into the spring fairly dry. So I would really be watching the saline areas for plants like this. Common burdock. Uh, there's common burdock here. There's a woolly burdock that's up north um, in Swan River today. And so we've got lots of woolly burdock up north. It's a very, very similar plant. Uh, would be the same as, as um, uh, there's other plants that have burrs on them, but basically you've got these ho these spines with little their little their hooks. Uh, they get caught. They can cause uh, dam you know mechanical or injury injuries to the animals um, through through those hooks. And also when they get on their fur as well, it can cause some some irritation too when they get when they get trapped in the fur. With wild oats uh, here, even just because there are awns on wild oats and they can be quite, um, you know, especially towards the end of its life cycle as the wild oat is mature, uh, the awns on wild oats can cause issues with feeding, similar to foxtail barley. Talking about nitrate poisoning now, uh, this can occur in most common annual forage and cereal crops in weeds as well. You can get nitrate poisoning from feed from weeds. It's most often seen in oat, hay, or straw. Um, lamb's quarters, here talking about one of the weeds, is commonly, uh, and also kosher can do this too, uh, commonly contain toxic quantities of nitrates and should never be fed. Um, it can occur as a result of high fertilization or a stress. Um, so that stress could be early frost, late drought, or hail um, on an immature crop. Nitrate poisoning can also occur in many common weeds, including Canada thistle, and we talked about lamb's quarters and kosher as well. When, a, when plants with a toxic amount of nitrates is consumed, a conversion of nitrate to nitrite occurs in the intestinal tract. Nitrite is, a, is absorbed into the bloodstream where it combines with hemoglobin to form meth, meth hemoglobin, methahemoglobin. And methahemoglobin does not combine with oxygen and therefore when large amounts are present, the oxygen carrying capacity is greatly reduced. The animal basically dies of anoxia, which is similar to carbon monoxide poisoning. Symptoms would include restlessness, frequent urination, and extreme weakness. The blood becomes dark brown. Animals will collapse, roll on their side, and die without a struggle. Postmortems reveal hemorrhaging and inflammation of the rumen and intestines. Uh, here's another one uh, talking about dicumarol poisoning, and we get this from sweet clover. And sweet clover has that sweet vanilla smell, which is actually caused by coumarin, which becomes more intense when the plant is dried. 
Coumarin, which is the main phytochemical of sweet clover, is in fact produced from another chemical, sorry, uh, melilotoside, after tissue breakdown. When sweet clover is not properly dried, it can produce an anticoagulant dicumarol. And the clinical signs of sweet clover poisoning um, include abortion or death of a calf shortly after birth, extensive bleeding from a genital tract of the dam, and hemorrhage into the tissues of the calf. And I think for more information, here is Linda's information, although I think she's um, at Dauphin now, uh, but that is her cell phone number and that is her, her uh, email address. And um, if you want to, Sean can provide you with my email address. It's mine is kim.brown at gov.mb.ca. And then my phone number, if you want to talk, you know, just about the weeds, I really um, can't help you very much with the feeding end of the things. Uh, but when it comes to plants and weeds, um, I can help you with that. And my number is 431-344-0239. And that's all I have for that. Thanks, Kim, for the presentation. I have seen aerograss in Western Water Hemlock around Lake Manitoba in mm -hmm. some saline areas so so it is present and i would suspect it is in other areas that that have salinity areas also yeah Producer. i think we'll, we really have to watch the saline areas this spring where pretty much the whole province is dry and and getting drier over the last number of years so those salinity areas those saline areas are increasing which decreases the amount of good species on them um and this increases the species that we don't want so you're just you know we just need to be careful of that and producers can send samples into the crop diagnostic lab for positive ID, I guess? Uh, yep, or pictures too. By all means, send me a picture. I, I get lots of pictures sent to me over the phone. And to, you know, if we, we all, if we can, if we need to get out to take a look at it, we can do that as well. We just try to make sure we can work that in. Uh, but for sure, and when you're dealing with suspected poisonous plants, you need to be on it as quick as possible. And especially... You know, there's not a lot of them that you need to know. So get familiar with with these, you know, these ones that we've mentioned today. Uh, you don't need to know dozens and dozens of plants. There's, you know, maybe a handful of plants that you need to be really careful with. Make sure you know those. And if you have any questions at all, by all means, you know, call one of us at Manitoba Agriculture. Yeah, and I have seen where overgrazing has led to consumption of some of these toxic plants. And and then the cattle are, are led to, to graze on some of the undesirable plants. So I guess a strategy can be to especially in the spring, allow your pastures to, to develop properly and allow for adequate growth before the cows are turned out this spring. Right, right. And and hopefully, you know, we have enough moisture to get those pastures going. Uh, I guess it just depends on what shape they're in and whether or not they were heavily grazed in the fall. Again, that's something that, you know, the producers can work with you guys and, and your team, Sean, on, on all of that. Um, but at the end of the day, you, you know, you want to be grazing desirable species first thing and you don't want to be putting them out um, on any of these other species, if you can at all help it, especially when they're coming off, you know, feed for the winter and they're coming off, you know, hay and, and, and feed for the winter. They do like to get out on the new growing plants and they really see, you know, they like to, they like to go to town on the new plants. So we have to be careful that we've just got desirable species for them. Yeah. Pasture management and, and overall nutrition of the livestock is so important to keeping them healthy and, and so that they can then um, gain properly and, and don't have to deal with some of these uh, toxic plants. Right. Right. Pat, do you have anything else for Kim? There are none right now. Um, I just have a question for Kim with regards to mm -hmm. any type of chemical control, for example. Mm -hmm. um, can you make any comments on yeah. that? Well, we do have in our guide to crop protection, our, it's called the guide to field crop protection. It comes out every year. It's at all the service centers. Um, the quickest way is there's a tables at the front of the guide and there's actually a couple of tables in there. I'm just flipping through it right now. Um, there is uh, table 20 is weed control in grass pastures and hay fields and we have weed control in forage crops, things like that. So there's, a, there's tables in there and then you can go to the product pages in the guide to read about those products. So there are a number of products you can put in, uh, you can put on, um, you know, there's um, depending on what weeds they have, there are. So again, that's something to talk with your retailer about, but we do have, um, if you start with the table, the grass pasture and hay field table is on page 83 this year. The guide is also available online as a PDF. You could download that and you can just go to that table and then you go to the product pages in the guide to get a bit more information. Of course, go to the label. I mean, I know a lot of guys, there's, there's a number of products that are being used um, depending whether you're going after, you know, poisonous weeds or versus even something just like leafy spurge. 
um, there's lots of there's lots of, of decent products available if you're going to be doing some spraying. Okay, thanks. Okay. So to help monitor the wild pig population, the Squeal on Pigs program was developed. Devin Bayett is the manager of field operations. And this winter, we had the Squeal on Pigs program gain some national press. I would like to welcome Devin to tell us more about their work. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, yeah, we've had actually really good uh, success in this last year. Um, yeah, and then today I'm really going to focus on um, how we get the public involved, mainly on how to identify um, and then report sightings. <clears throat> can you guys hear me well? Yes, yeah, we can. Through... All right, so uh, so what are wild pigs in Manitoba? So basically any pig that's not confined to somebody's property, we just, we, we call it a wild pig. So uh, this can include uh, wild boar, uh, populated pigs, um, or even just domestic pigs that have escaped and become feral. So typically um, this is what our wild boar look like. Um, they're darker in color, they have that long nose, um, bit stockier than domestic pigs. Um, but yeah, that's basically what they look for. So um, Eurasian wild boar were actually introduced into Manitoba in the 80s. Um, they thought there was going to be a niche market for them. But uh, basically, there, there really was no market. Um, and, and at one time, they expected there was around 30,000 wild boar being produced across the prairies. So there was a lot of wild pigs um, out there at one time. Um, and then once that market collapsed, um, some escaped, some were released, and then uh, the small populations did begin breeding in the wild. Um, everyone thought they would just die off through the winters, but they did start populating. So right now, wild pigs are recognized as an invasive species. Um, they do quite a bit of damage to environment and ecosystems, um, to agriculture crops and pastures. And they pose a real risk for carrying diseases. So uh, a lot of the work we do is, is funded actually through Manitoba pork. Um, they're very concerned about the potential for wild pigs to spread diseases um, to their barns, uh, particularly African swine fever. So to go over some signs of wild pigs, um, visual observation is ideal. Um, unfortunately, wild pigs are mainly nocturnal. Um, so very rarely do we get any reported sightings of people actually seeing pigs. Um, mo most common we get is rooting. Um, but the, the most common ways to identify uh, the presence is scats, uh, tracks, wallowing, and, and rooting. Um, and I'm just going to go over uh, the last two here today. So uh, wild pig wallows um, are, are pretty easy to identify. Um, we'll see these out on uh, along dugouts um, or creeks or streams, and it's basically a depression that's that's made into the the mud uh, where the pigs go and and try to get some mud on themselves to uh, protect themselves from some sunlight um, and insects. So guys on the pastures, if they they notice this, uh, definitely do give us a call. Um, and the next is rooting. So uh, wild pigs have that uh, really well-built, designed, long nose, I guess, very similar to a plow, uh, to dig and, and root up uh, any sod. So we see um, pretty extensive damage out on pastures and haylands. Um, so the pigs will use their long snout to dig under and then flip over the sod. Um, so other species might be more digging, whereas uh, we do see them flipping over like two foot size chunks of sod um, just look for roots, worms, or other food sources underneath. So again, that sod will be more flipped uh, rather than dug into. So a lot of our areas, uh, we do also have bears and raccoons uh, and skunks that will be more digging into the uh, sod. Uh, but it's it's usually more of a, a flipped, um, yeah, how it looks like. So most of the rooting is actually on short grasses. 
um, so ditch lines um, or, or pastures. And yeah, that's typically where we see uh, most of our, our rooting damage. Um, and it's also most common at transitions. So it can be either uh, a ditch line to a field or a forest edge along a pasture, but it's, it's typically right in that transition area. Um, when I'm scouting around areas, I'll look for cornfields and I'll just drive along usually the north shaded side of those cornfields. And if there's pigs in the area, they will go to those short grass, grass in the ditch. Um, and that's typically where we'll see some rooting. Uh, pigs will also root under cow patties. So um, this is just one pasture where we're looking at, we've seen these small rooted areas going for about 50 feet in one direction. And were, they were spaced about every five feet and we couldn't figure out exactly what it was at first, but then we went out there and realized that that was a cow had been walking along there and depositing its cow its manure there. And then uh, shortly after the pigs found it and they were going and rooting up, looking for the beetles, obviously that were in there. Um, and then they'll continue to go back into those same spots. So pigs will also root uh, pretty significant areas of grassland. So this is actually out in Spruce Woods Park. Um, so there's acres um, of areas like this that have been damaged by the wild pigs. And once it gets like this, it's very hard to reestablish that, um, especially in native grassland areas. So the damage they do is, is yeah, it's, it's quite, yeah, it's a lot. Uh, so pigs can also be attracted to certain specific species of vegetation. Um, so this was a pig that was out uh, kind of in the Oak Lake area, and it had a particular attractant to wolf willows. Uh, so for whatever reason, it preferred to go and root up along the roots of the wolf willows. And we were able to track that pig um, through different pastures in the area because it was going after this specific plant. So um, yeah, they can be attracted to just one particular one. We didn't see that in other areas. Um, other areas, we might see them going under small poplar um, or Saskatoons, different bushes. So they do seem to have different um, species that they're, they're interested in, in rooting up. And they're also very attracted to areas that have been previously rooted. So they may only go back to that area once a year, but we have certain spots where we know that have been rooted up and they will go back there the following spring and then re-root up that area. So um, obviously there's a food source there and then once they've rooted it up, they're flipping that sod, creating some decomposition, there's gonna be some worms in the soil and then they're just going back in there year after year and um, yeah, foraging on what's available. So they're also attracted to open ground. Um, so this is just a rut uh, in a back road. Uh, yeah, a little trail and then there, it had been opened up and the pigs found it and then they just continued to dig down uh, and root up that spot. So it kind of damaged that trail actually, you can't drive through there anymore. Um, so that can be pretty significant on your trails. And in orc forests, um, they can root up huge areas. Um, so they're looking for acorns and they will go and try to dig out all of the squirrel catches on the base of the trees and, and all over. So we see huge areas that have been rooted up where there's a where there's any bur oak. Um, so some other signs to look out for is pigs will always seem to uh, run through the fence lines. So a deer or elk will stop um, usually a foot or two before that fence line and then hop over that. So where you see areas where there's continual tracks through the fence line, um, that's pretty good sign that there's wild pigs there. And then obviously if it's a barbed wire, they're gonna be leaving some hair um, to also identify them. So we find uh, pigs will make their beds um, mainly on our spruce trees. Um, we haven't found a lot in cattails, but we have we found a few, I guess, um, but, but mainly up in higher, higher, uh, yeah, higher ridge lines is where we see most of their bedding. Um, and just under a large spruce tree. So they just dig, dig in the soil a little bit and just lay down right in there. So this is your typical um, wild pig habitat that, that we're seeing most of our pigs. Um, most people expect them to be in the low areas and the marshlands, um, but we're seeing them actually in the highlands. So areas where there's some open um, sand prairie, um, 
yeah, and just mixed mixed spruce is where the pigs really seem to like to, to be. And cows. So we do see uh, a pretty strong relationship between wild pigs and cattle. Um, when there's limited food sources, the pigs will actually just bed and stay right in um, with the cows. Um, and we've, we've moved in traps literally right in, you know, the straw packs and, and caught pigs there. So um, you won't see them because they're usually showing up there at night. But um, but yeah, there's there's a pretty strong relationship between cattle because there's a food source there and, and obviously there's bedding too. So um, yeah, definitely keep an eye out for, for that. Um, and corn. So corn is is their primary artificial food source um, that they go for. So it, once that corn gets three, four feet tall, they'll just head into those corn fields and stay there all summer. Um, and then they'll just use it as a food source once those heads mature. Um, yeah, so we, we do a lot of scouting over in the corn fields for sure. So we have a, a website and a phone in line to report sightings. Uh, this is what the form looks like. Just get some pretty basic information, your name, phone number, what you saw, possible location. Um, and then we go in and try to confirm that sighting. So we actually have uh, four thermal drones that we use now to scout locations. They've been the most useful tool we have. Um, so we can fly over a cornfield and locate pigs or a marshland or a forest area. So there's a picture of uh, some pigs that were in a cornfield. Uh, you'd never see them from the road. And, and even with just a regular drone camera, they weren't, they weren't obvious at all. Um, we have to turn those thermal cameras on to actually see them. But when you do, it's, it's very obvious that there is pigs in that field. Uh, once we've made a confirmation or suspect, I guess, that there's pigs there, we'll set out a cell camera. Um, so with pigs, they're very sensitive to human scent. So we set up these cell cameras and then we can remotely uh, view them. So we're not leaving a bunch of human scent there going back every week or two to, to monitor these sites, which has been, it's essential basically. Um, and then what we do is we set these up mainly on private lands where there's been rooting or damage and then the landowner is connected to that camera. So we can also see what's going on uh, 24 seven at that location. So we add um, solar power packs um, as well as boosters and bare boxes to all of our cameras. Um, so that way, once it's set up, it can run there for for years, literally. So uh, we're not needing to go, actually go back to those sites, which again is essential. So we do use some attractants to uh, bring the pigs to the camera site so we know what's there. Uh, so we typically use whole corn uh, that we've soured. So we basically just fill it up with water, um, leave it for a week, we may add some yeast, we may add some jello powder, just to increase the fermentation process, and it just sours it. Um, deer and elk aren't attracted to it. And then what we typically do in the summers when we're able to is we dig down a few feet and we, we bury it. So raccoons and other species can't get to it, but the pigs, if they're in the area, they definitely will smell it and find it. So once we have a confirmation of pigs, um, action is taken. So we work with the landowners. We'll find a site um, where we can set up a corral trap. And we have uh, over 30 of these corral traps. Um, and that's what's used mainly to capture and remove the pigs. So it's a pretty simple design. They're just eight foot long panels. Um, the caging we use, it's a combo style caging. So it's got really small um, holes at the bottom, it goes a little bit larger near the top. It's about five feet high. Uh, it's got a reinforcing bar about two feet high. So that way if the pigs are caught, then they're, they're, they're gonna be, they're upset when they're caught and they're, uh, it just pr protects that panel from getting damaged. And then we use uh, an eight foot wide drop gate. That's pretty key with wild pigs. They're uh, pretty cautious with going through any openings. So you need a, a nice wide opening to attract them in there. Um, and then we usually set it about three, maybe four feet high, and it just restricts cattle from get, being able to get in there. Um, but then, yeah, the pigs go in there and they're, they're caught. 
So we use rooting uh, stick triggers. It's a really simple device. It's just basically a cable that goes from the drop gate back to the back two thirds, three quarters of the trap. And it's just got a stick attached to it. Um, and then there's just two rebar pins holding that in place. And then we will bury corn underneath of that and we'll get deer and raccoons and even calves or something. They, they can wander in there, um, but they won't go and move that stick. Um, if it's deer or something, if there's any corn spilt on the surface, they might, they might feed on it. Um, but pigs, they just have a natural um, behavior of, of pushing stuff out of the way. So they, they're used to pushing sticks and logs um, in the bushes and stuff. So as soon as they see a stick like that and they can smell something underneath, they will just put their nose, dig down and push that stick out of the way, which then drops the trap and, and captures them. So it's been really successful. Um, like I said, we have over 30 of these traps across the province. So we do also use um, some continuous uh, net trap, cat catch net traps. Um, we trialed these last year and we had really good success with them. Um, they're limited uh, because they are a net, so they don't last as long. Um, there's issues with them, uh, with if antler deer, bears, and other wildlife possibly getting captured. So we only can use these for a short season, I guess, mainly from January to March. Um, but when we do, um, basically the pigs work their way um, underneath of the nets towards the center. And once they get to the center of the trap, then the net kind of falls back to the ground. And then it allows for just continuous capture. So we can catch one pig can come in at five o'clock in the evening. And then at seven o'clock, another pig can come in and 10 o'clock and 2 a.m. And all through the night, we can continually catch um, pigs. So they are very effective. Um, they're limited by a few things is that typically they're used in the States. Um, they're set up using T posts and they're made in about a 20 foot diameter. And they're, the net is held up on the T post where we're using them, you know, January to March, it's frozen ground. So what we did is we modified all our sites um, to, to set them up on trees and we had really good success with them. So like you see in this picture, you know, there's two 300 plus pound thousand with 11 juveniles. So if we're able to capture groups like that in one night, like that's, it's, yeah, they've been very successful. So present. So um, this is a updated map from January of all the locations that we've had uh, sightings reported to us. So we get, we get sightings pretty much across the entire province. Not all of them are confirmed wild pigs. Some of them could be pop bellies um, or it could be rooting that maybe it was a bear or something else. But these are areas where we've gotten public reporting in. Um, so it kind of shows that we, we actually are getting very good reporting across the province. Uh, so most people are aware that we do have wild pigs. Um, our hotspot is southeast of Brandon um, in the Spruce Woods Park area because there's a lot more public in, in out there and, and there's a lot more pigs out there. So that's one of our target areas uh, that we're constantly trapping pigs. The rest of the areas, we actually are mainly seeing uh, large boars. So singular, mature males, just kind of roaming the countryside looking for sex. Um, not that they're, you know, not a, not a problem, but they're not, they're not a reproductive um, population really we're seeing outside of Spruce Woods, um, which is good so far. So um, yeah, this is pretty consistent year to year uh, of how we get reported in sightings too. So it's, yeah, across the province. As far as population, um, we don't really know. Um, it varies so much year to year. We do see pretty high mortality um, in, in years when it's really cold with deep snow. Um, the smaller juveniles, they just can't survive that cold temperatures. There's just less food sources available during those winters. Um, with the ground froze, frozen in the deep snow. Um, so we do see yeah, definitely some mortality over those winters. This year is the exception. Um, it was mild and very little snow. So it was actually a really good year for pigs. Um, and in most of Manitoba was actually a massed acorn crop. So there was a, a huge amount of acorns dropped 
um, in the fall. So that just gives them a, a huge amount of food uh, reserves going into winter and, and through winter. Um, but still we're seeing some now coming out of winter that are definitely in, in you know, poor condition. Uh, so we do use uh, a variety of techniques to determine uh, presence of population. So when hunters um, shoot pigs, they're required to submit that to us. Um, so we get an idea of population that way. Uh, we do a, a large amount of field scouting and then our thermal drone surveillance. We have over 90 cell camera cameras across the province just monitoring areas. So that's very useful. Uh, we started working with ACC to do eDNA uh, water sampling. So we're going out to creeks and streams, uh, collecting water samples and then sending it to a lab. And then they're testing for any uh, pig DNA in that water. And then we're able to decide you know, if there is any pigs upstream um, of that area or not. Uh, we partnered with the province natural resources program to do some aerial surveys in Southwest Manitoba. They were already going out there for moose and elk. So we partnered with them to then collect data on any wild pig presence and then public reporting. So that's by far, that's the most useful. Um, that's where all those little squares are. And without that, yeah, you know, that's, that's definitely the key is getting uh, the public involved in uh, reporting any, any other sightings. So, so with that, uh, we use all that data uh, that then, you know, put some uh, plans in place for the future where we're going to target. Yeah, and that's it. So you guys have any questions? Can you comment on hunting of wild boar? Do you want people out there hunting them? Yeah, so, I mean, it's it's been proven now that hunting, it does not help control the population. Um, if anything, it, it definitely makes it a, a much harder to control the population because it ends up just, you know, you shoot one out of a group and then the rest spread. Um, and really what happens is it just ends up, people are going in those areas where we could be trapping them instead. The trapping is by far the most successful and effective way of removing the pigs. So if there is any pigs, um, especially when we run our program where we provide the cameras and the bait and the traps to the landowners that, it just doesn't make sense to go out there and try to shoot them, especially because they are nocturnal. Like very rarely are they seen during daylight hours. So um, yeah, hunting is just not effective. If it was effective, we'd be using it. Um, like I'm a hunter myself. And if it was effective, that's what we'd be doing. Um, but it's not. So. Yeah. And that one trap you had, would you say 12 or 13 pigs, pigs in it? Do you catch yeah. that any very often or was that? Kind of the, no, the, that, that was actually one of our records now. So we've caught a few. Um, we did have one, I'll say a one hunter who shot uh, two out of a group of 11. And then we worked with them and then we were able to capture all the other nine or pigs that were there. Um, but no, typically in Manitoba, our, our pigs are in really small groups. We see them in, you know, three to five. Um, you don't see those in the States, you know, they show like 40, 50 pigs together. Um, yeah, we, we don't see that. We see it in these really small groups typically. So when we can capture, um, yeah, 13 that time, especially two mature sows. Um, in that case, both those sows were over 300 pounds. Um, those 11 juveniles that were with them were between 60 and, and, uh, 80 pounds. And those two sows, um, I believe they had 16 piglets inside of them between the two. So, um, that was a pretty meaningful capture just with yeah it was like 29 pigs they technically removed to that one one night so, so you had a celebration after that catch yeah it was nice yeah it was good Pam did you have anything for for Devin there are no questions at this time okay thank you Devin for your interesting presentation yeah, thank right. you for having me. So replacement heifer development and management. We have Andrea Berthelay, who is a livestock and forage specialist in Killarney, who is going to tell us more about this topic. With high cattle prices, producers are in a dilemma whether they should keep more heifers to build the herd or do they want to ma maintain the herd numbers at the status quo and, and maximize sales. So I'd like to welcome Andrea. 
Okay, can you see my screen? Looks good. Perfect. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, as Sean said, my name is Andrea, um, and I am going to talk to you a bit about heifer development and management. Uh, get my screen to be able to click the right button. There we go. Okay, so the management and development of heifers prior to breeding and before, during, and after their first calving will set the tone for a female's entire productive lifetime. So developing heifers and putting some thought and planning and effort into managing those heifers prior to breeding them, and then as well, once they calve and have that first calf, sets the tone for their entire life. Um, so it's something that we definitely want to think about and um, put some planning to. So a few things I'm going to talk about today um, are selection. I'm gonna to touch on it very quickly, um, not talk too much about that, but gonna focus more on body condition and nutrition of those replacement heifers and first calf heifers, um, maturity, breeding plans, and then managing that first calf heifer. So selection, uh, there's a few things to consider when you are selecting replacement heifers. The first thing is, are you going to keep your own replacement heifers um, from your own herd and breeding program? Or are you gonna be purchasing in um, replacement heifers from another producer, another breeding program? Um, and are you gonna be purchasing them as open heifers and then you make the breeding decision on them or are you buying in bred heifers? Um, so lots of different options for producers. Um, there is no right way or wrong way to do that. It totally depends on your management and your goals of your breeding program. Uh, confirmation equals longevity. So ensuring the heifers that you select, whether out of your own herd or from another producer purchased in heifers, making sure you are selecting uh, heifers that are uh, structurally sound, um, are the type and style of what you want um, and what you want your their, their progeny to be. Um, Use of performance records to track progress of your herd. So this is especially important if you're keeping your own home raised replacement heifers, um, being able to track which cows produce what kind of calves and what are your goals, um, being able to look back at um, calving rate, um, at what time in the calving season do they breed up early, um, all those sorts of things. Um, and that kind of leads into cow families, um, watching which cow families are consistent producers year after year, selecting females out of those, those cows um, might be a benefit to you. Um, if you're selecting uh, registered females, um, EPDs are definitely a tool that can help select for certain characteristics. However, they are not the gospel. Um, they are just a tool to help you make those decisions. Um, maybe more so important when you're looking um, at uh, purchasing in a bull to breed your heifers, um, if you are breeding replacement heifers. Um, so EPDs can help um, select those as well. Uh, uniform cow herd equals a uniform calf crop. The more uniform your calf crop is, the better marketing opportunities you have um, for that calf. So um, being able to select a uniform heifer group will just in the long run um, equate to a uniform cow herd. Um, I did write an article in uh, the cattle country back in September on selection of replacement heifers. Um, so if you are interested in more information on that, you can go to the MBP website um, and you can look up the September issue of the cattle country and take a look at that article. Body condition. <clears throat> really important when we're managing um, our replacement heifers. So in some cases, the replacement heifer pen can get neglected, but it shouldn't. As that quote said right at the start of the presentation, um, how those heifers are managed will dictate their productive capacity, um, their product productive potential um, for the rest of their life. Uh, so this is a really important time in their life um, that they should be managed well. Uh, we want to aim for heifers to be 65% of their mature weight at the time of breeding. Um, there has been some research saying that 55% of their mature weight is can work as well. There are a few cautionaries um, if you are going to be aiming for that lower percent of mature weight. Um, you know, stage of maturity, making sure they're earlier maturing, later maturing animals definitely need to be that 65% of their body weight um, and that sort of thing. So I still really like the rule of thumb, make sure your heifers are 65% of mature weight at the time of breeding. As we're developing those heifers prior to breeding, we wanna ensure that they're gaining one and a half to two pounds per day. Um, that just ensures that they are in the condition that they, and will get to that 65% uh, body weight when they go to breed. 
then once they're bred leading up to that first time calving, um, we want to be increasing that plane of nutrition at least six to eight weeks prior to calving, making sure they're producing um, adequate colostrum, maintaining condition, um, all that sort of thing. And we want our heifers to calve at that two and a half to three body condition score. Uh, body condition score is, is really important um, and can have um, some impacts as well. So this is a, a graphic from the BCRC website. Um, and research shows that the first calf heifers that calve um, with a body condition score of three had pregnancy rates over 90% in the next breed. So the rebreeding interval after having their first calf was 90% conception. Uh, heifers that had less than a three body condition score, their subsequent pregnancy rates was below 70%. So that is a huge difference. And when calves are worth what they are, uh, these days, we want to get as many of those heifers back in calf uh, the next year as we can. So ensuring that those first calf heifers are adequate body condition score at calving and from calving to rebreeding is really important. Now we talk about, you know, making sure that they're in good enough condition is important um, as there's many factors that are many things that can happen if they are under conditioned, uh, but over condition can have its impacts as well. Um, you know, high body fat, their mobility, longevity may be impacted, um, increased calving problems. So increased dystocia, um, if they've got that extra fat deposits in their pelvic area, um, and it can impact their long-term milk production as well as they, there could be fat de deposits in that udder that just um, reduce their milking production. So some things to consider um, in keeping the uh, condition of your heifers and um, first calf heifers. So I'm going to talk about nutrition because in order to get those body condition scores, we need to feed adequately. So there are five main nutrients that all cattle require, um, energy, protein, minerals, vitamins, and water. So those are the five main nutrients when you're developing a ration or feeding any class of cattle. Um, that's Those are the five things we want to talk about. So energy. Energy is required in the largest amount. Uh, it's required to maintain bodily functions and for growth. Uh, environmental conditions can influence the amount um, of energy required just to maintain themselves. So the, if it's a really cold winter or a really windy day, um, their energy requirements go up. Um, so when we're feeding, we want to take that into account. If all of a sudden it drops to minus 35 for a week, we want to make sure not only our cows are getting a little extra energy, but our heifers need it too. Um, so energy is partitioned to maintenance first and then gain, and then growth, and then reproduction, and then lactation. So this is really important to remember this because if we short our heifers on energy to just maintain and gain a bit, they're not gonna be growing or maybe reach their mature size or re get to that 65% of their mature weight by, by breeding. Um, and on top of that, where they're going to be giving up their reproductive capacity um, as well. And then when we think about our first calf heifers, if we're shorting them on energy, they're going to give up lactation first. So that's going to impact that calf that they're trying to raise. And when, like I said, when calves are worth what they are, we want to make sure every heifer can produce um, a calf to the best of their potential. So ensuring they have the energy to keep milking um, and lactating uh, will be in, in your benefit. So TDN requirements um, to think about, just to give you kind of a ballpark idea, we want those replacement heifers, depending what gain you're looking for, um, is that one and a half to two pounds of average daily gain. So 63 to 68% of energy, so TDN um, in their total ration. And then for those first calf heifers, we're, this is for lactating cows, we want their ration to be 60 to 65% TDN. On those first calf heifers, we definitely want them in around that 65% TDN on the total ration because those first calf heifers, they're still growing. So they still have some growth in there, plus they're lactating, plus we want them to rebreed. So we're asking a lot of those first calf heifers while they're still trying to do a lot. Let's make sure we give them the energy to do that. The next thing I'm going to talk about is protein. So protein. There's two different kinds of protein we talk about when we talk about nutrition and ration balancing. So DIP is degradable intake protein. So that's the protein that is utilized by the microbes in the rumen. So because cattle are ruminants, protein is um, digested a little bit differently. So some protein is used by the microbes and then 
the animal then digests the microbe. Um, so there's DIP and then undegradable intake protein is the protein that passes through the rumen. And then that protein is directly absorbed um, by the intestine and utilized by the animal. So knowing what types of protein sources you're, you are using, that ratio of DIP to UIP might be different. Uh, so protein requirements, um, when we're talking about replacement heifers, it's going to depend on the size of replacement heifer that you have. Um, at smaller animals require higher amount of protein because their rate of growth is a lot higher. So they need protein for that rate of growth. Um, so, you know, the 550 to 8 weight, 14% protein on the total ration. And as they get bigger, that protein requirement goes down. And then when we talk about our first calf heifers, they are lactating as well as still growing. So in that 12% um, protein on that ration at that time as well. Cows, mature cows can get away with that 11%, but I like to see those first calf heifers giving them um, the tools that they need to, to produce the best calf they can. Minerals. So there are two types of minerals, macro minerals and micro minerals. Macros are the ones that are required in the largest amount. Um, we talk about them as a percent of the diet. Uh, some of these are your calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, sodium, chloride or chlorine and sulfur. Calcium and phosphorus are will probably be the two major ones that you always hear when you talk about a two to one mineral. That's your calcium to phosphorus ratio. Um, so those will be two that you'll wanna look at for sure. And then on the micro mineral size, these ones are required in smaller amount, uh, expressed as the parts per million. Um, the big ones I want to bring attention to here when we're talking about reproductive capacity and getting replacement heifers bred and in calf, and same as those second calvers back rebred, having a good breeder mineral with your copper, zinc, and manganese, make sure those three things are in there at high levels. Um, to make sure that uh, they're getting the minerals that they need so that they can rebreed um, as, as the best they can. Um, so mineral intake, it depends on the mineral that you're feeding, definitely. Um, read the tags, read the labels, um, but in general, that kind of three to four ounces per head per day is uh, the intake needed on mineral. Um, if you're feeding a green feed or cereal based ration, you'll definitely need at least a two to one mineral. So two parts calcium to one part FOS. Um, a lot of times a three to one or added calcium is needed at that time, especially on those lactating uh, cows. Um, legume based, so if they're getting a lot of alfalfa type ration, a one to one is sufficient. Um, so um, when it comes to breeding your copper, manganese and zinc, make sure those levels are at minimum 3,000, 8,000 and 10,000 accordingly, um, parts per million. That, that, those are the levels that would be required in general um, for a good breeder mineral. So when it comes to minerals, cows eat what they like, not necessarily what they need. Um, cows will eat until they're full, given to voluntary free choice feeds. So as long as they've got enough feed for them, they're going to eat until they're full. Um, trying to get that mineral into them um, can be challenging sometimes. Um, and I know on social media, I've seen a lot lately of these this um, free choice minerals. So giving them the raw minerals separately and letting them pick what they need. Um, they, they're not going to choose what they need. They don't know the difference. Um, they can't tell the difference. They don't know that they, they'll like what they'll eat what they like, basically what that comes down to. Um, so making sure that you have a well-balanced mineral, a uh, high quality mineral um, that you can get into them uh, is, is important. Um, minerals fed for your choice. Sometimes that's our only option and that's okay. Doing that is better than nothing for sure. Um, but it does have variable intake. Um, if you have the option to feed a small amount of grain or pellets and mix that mineral in with them. That is the best way to have everyone get the minerals that they need um, and ensure each cow gets her share or each heifer gets her share um, and make sure there's enough bunk space for them. Um, when it comes to mineral supplementation and reproductive uh, performance, it is crucially important. As you can see from this list, there are lots of uh, lots of different mineral deficiencies can cause reproductive deficiencies as well, or reduced reproductive performance. So low conception rates, delayed puberty. Um, so, and a lot of times you'll see this copper, manganese, and zinc are those three minerals that are in 
the culprits for a lot of these reproductive performance um, reductions. Uh, so this just reiterates how important it is to make sure that your replacement heifers are on a good mineral program. <clears throat> Uh, vitamins uh, are a unique dietary uh, nutrient for ruminants. Um, they don't require all the vitamins in their diet like we do. Um, Water-soluble vitamins, like your B and C vitamins, um, we don't actually need to supplement them in the diet because they are a rumen uh, or a ruminant. The rumen microbes actually synthesize and create those vitamins for them. But the fat soluble vitamins, your A, D, and E, um, we do need to um, make sure that they are getting enough of those. Um, usually it's a combination of mineral as well as injectable supplementation a couple of times throughout the year. So definitely something to consider. Um, vitamins don't last long, uh, don't have a long shelf life. So that's why it's hard to put too, uh, enough of them in a mineral. Um, so that's where injectable a couple of times a year is, is beneficial as well. So moving on from nutrition uh, to maturity. So when we're talking about developing replacement heifers, um, we want to make sure that the heifers are cycling regularly prior to breeding. We want to make sure that they are having a couple regular cycles before they get exposed to a bull um, and make sure those ovaries are developing accordingly. Um, sometimes having them palpated by a veterinarian just to ensure the ovaries are um, uh, of adequate size, you know, the repro tract is, is um, sound, that sort of thing can really help um, pull out some of those heifers that you might keep and uh, manage for a long time and then still end up not getting in calf. Um, so that is something that could be beneficial. Um, breed character, so are they late or early maturing um, and targeting that 65% of mature body weight um, at the time of breeding. Breeding plans. Um, so genetics can be uh, considered when you're planning out uh, breeding your replacement heifers, um, breed characteristics and sire selection, um, not only of the heifers that you're selecting, but also the sire that you're going to use on those heifers to breed them. Uh, Cull heifers prior to breeding that show signs of unsoundness, so lameness, illness, irregular cycles, or not cycling at all. This is where palpation can, can um, help you cull out some of those heifers that may not be uh, reproductively sound. And then timing of breeding. Uh, when do you want to breed your heifers? Uh, it, it is um, can be helpful to breed heifers earlier than the cows, so give your heifers an extra two weeks um, before you turn the bulls out with the cows. Um, that helps with, that means they calve earlier in the calving season and they have a bit longer of uh, interval from the time of calving to the next rebreeding. That just helps their uterus and everything recover, gives them a little bit more time and can ensure um, a good conception rate on that next rebreeding. Um, Pre-breeding vaccination is really important uh, for the prevention of reproductive failure. Failure. Um, so if we have any of these venereal diseases come in, um, that is going to significantly impact your uh, conception rates, um, not only on your heifers, but on your cows as well. So IBR and BVD are the two big ones. There's lots of different vaccination um, um, vaccines available. Um, definitely a discussion worth having with your veterinarian on which product is best to use in your herd and the timing of vaccination. Um, this is something we don't want to vaccinate them, you know, the day of or the day before you go to turn the bull out, um, because this is a live vaccine. Usually um, that can impact uh, conception rates at the, the start. If they're given a live vaccine right off the start of breeding, um, those first that first service to the bull um, may not be a successful uh, a successful one. So definitely something to, to discuss with your local veterinarian. So managing that first calf heifer. So we've developed this heifer calf. We've She's been cycling. We've got her bred. We've managed her up until calving. Um, even once she's calved and part of the cow herd, she still needs some TLC. She's still um, growing herself, um, but she is now lactating as well and trying to raise a calf. Plus we want her to get um, in calf and pregnant again. Um, so there's a lot of things going on for these first calf heifers. We definitely want to make sure that they've got adequate energy and protein in their ration. Um, and that way they can continue lactating, they can raise a good calf um, and return to estrus and have a successful breeding the next, um, the next time. So nutrition is truly key in managing those first calf heifers and getting them rebred again. 
Um, so making sure they're on an increasing plane of nutrition before calving. Um, thin heifers, heifers at calving can lead to dystocia. Fat heifers can have dystocia issues as well. So calving issues. Um, so finding that that balance of that three, two and a half to three body condition score is really important. Um, managing first calf heifers separate from the main cow herd um, is, is beneficial. These heifers do need more, more energy and protein than, than the average cow herd. Um, so then they don't have to compete with those big bossy old cows um, for the feed bunk space either. Um, so that can definitely make things a little bit easier on them. Uh, dystocia, so calving problems with first calf heifers. Um, there can be a higher risk of calving difficulties with first calf heifers. One, they've never done it before. Um, two, they're a bit smaller uh, than a cow. Um, so birth weight and pelvic size are two things that you can take a look at when you're selecting not only your heifers, um, but also your sire, um, your sire that you're using on your heifers. Um, so we do want to look at calving ease and low birth weight um, service sires for our heifers, um, but we don't want to give up on performance either. Calves are worth good money right now. Um, allowing your heifers, managing your heifers to be able to raise a decent calf um, is definitely worth it. Um, so take a look at the build of the bull as well as EPDs can help you make those decisions. Um, and calving trouble, we wanna reduce the amount of calving trouble we have on these first calf heifers because anytime you do have um, a hard pull or anything like that, it does take that uterus longer to recover um, and may take them longer to return to estrus or show that first cycle um, after calving. So that calving to breeding interval um, can be longer on, on um, heifers that have some calving trouble. So we do wanna do the best we can to, to reduce that. So in a nutshell, that was a lot of information, um, but a few take home messages um, from this is replacement heifers should be that 55 to 65% of mature body weight at breeding time. I like to lean towards that 65% uh, definitely. Um, breed heifers two weeks prior to the main cow herd. Uh, that gives them a little more time in that rebreeding interval, that time from calving to rebreeding to recover, have that uterus recover and make sure they're, you know, having one or two good cycles before they're exposed to the bull again. Um, ensure an increasing plane of nutrition prior to calving on those first calf heifers. Um, feed them separately from the main cow herd. That way they don't have to compete. They're smaller than those cows. Um, and we all have those big bossy cows that won't let anything within three feet of them on either side of the feeder or the bunk line. So, um, you know, feeding the heifer separately definitely can, can take away that competition factor. And sire selection of, you know, the service sire as well as the sire um, breeding or genetic composition of the, the replacement heifers that you're selecting. So I felt like I went through that really fast and there was a lot of information there. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Uh, my contact information is um, on the screen there. So feel free to reach out with me by phone or email um, if you have any questions or would like to discuss anything. So Sean, is there any questions? Thanks, Andrea. I'm glad you did touch on the nutrition part of the raising the heifers and as well as the first calf heifers. I mean, after lactation, that's the most important nutritional period for the for the animal. So it, it is important to make sure that the energy and protein and, and mineral and vitamins are balanced. For sure. For sure. I think that that is very important. And I do think that sometimes the replacement heifers do get neglected a little bit um, when it comes to managing them. So it's it is definitely something to to consider. And I liked your covered mineral tub because so often, especially free choice mineral. It's put out, it's weathered, it's snowed on, it's rained on. The cattle don't want to eat yeah. it once it's weathered. And, and protecting that mineral improves yeah. consumption and encourages the cattle just to, to eat adequate amounts or, or more mineral than they would otherwise. For sure. I find those those mineral tubs that have that rubber flap over the top of them, the cattle catch on to it really quick. They figure out pretty quick what's in there. And it does protect it from weathering, rain, that sort of thing very well. Yeah, and even younger calves will... will yep. The hang of it and and start eating the mineral that's that's under that flap and it's not that heavy so it doesn't take much for them to to lift it up no yeah they do work very well they're a little bit more expensive but definitely worth worth the investment yeah minerals not cheap either so protecting that investment in the mineral is definitely worth it uh, one comment i guess on on mineral different minerals are are more or less palatable than than others so uh, mm -hmm. just mentioned to producers if 
if they have a mineral they're not getting adequate consumption that they should look at maybe a different type of mineral where uh, the mm -hmm. formulation is, is slightly different and their their the consumption might be a little better on a different mineral yeah for sure so there are lots of mineral options out there and if you find your cows aren't eating the mineral that you have uh, maybe look at something some of them have different sweeteners or um, appetite enhancers can be added to them too um but yeah, definitely uh, there's lots of options there to increase uh, consumption of them if you don't think they're getting enough. And you mentioned looking at the mineral tag. Uh, some minerals are, are a lot lower in the micro minerals and even vitamin A than, than others. So you, you yeah. generally, you get what you pay for when it comes to, to mineral and, and like a lot of things. Yeah, for sure. Always take a look at those tags um, for you know what's actually in it, as well as what the feeding rate should be and how much they should be eating. So I'll just ask Pam if she had anything on the chat. There are no questions. Okay, I'd like to thank, thank Andrea for her presentation. Perfect, thanks for having me, Sean. Well, thank you. And also like to thank all the other presenters that uh, we had today. We had Devin talking about squeal on pigs as well as Kim Brown talking about poisonous plants on pasture. And we had a number of our forage and livestock specialists participate today with Andrew being in Killarney, Pam is in Dauphin, Elizabeth Nuremberg is in Roblin, uh, Cindy Jack is in Arburg, and myself in, in Portage, and then Kristen Bouchard-Teasdale is in Bozager. So if you do still need some assistance with nutrition, we still have anywhere from five to six to seven weeks of, of winter feeding. And with lactation being that important nutritional period, we want to make sure that the cattle are getting adequate energy and protein, minerals and vitamins, so that then they're on a raising, rising plane of nutrition going into that breeding season. And then if you have any, any questions for MASC, whether it's with lending or with insurance, there's uh, 10 offices across the province that you can contact. So that concludes today's Stock Talk. I'd like to thank you for joining and I'm glad you could participate.